Welcome back. In the last video, we saw the role of syntax in logix, and we did so using the illustrative example of propositional logic. And in this video, we're going to complete our overview of logix with the third and final element, the deductive system. So first of all, it's a really good idea to motivate why we want this deductive system at all. And the root of it is that we want to be able to prove various things, various properties about sentences which we write down about the real world using the syntax. And what property do we actually want to prove? Well, what we really mean by this the majority of the time is that we want to show when something is true. We are concerned solely with truthhood. So let's look at some examples. This is a sentence we can write down in propositional logic, F. We saw in the last video that under the semantics, this sentence maps to zero. It's false. Another sentence we could write down is P. P is a symbol. It has no inherent meaning, but we assign it a meaning using an interpretation. And so we don't know statically what P is. It could be one in one interpretation, or it could be zero in another. Here's a final example. It's a bit longer than the other two. Don't panic. Don't necessarily try and understand what this is doing intuitively. What we are saying is not P and Q implies not P or not Q. But the point of showing you this example is to say that, well, although this sentence contains symbols, a bit like this sentence, P, it is always true under the semantics. Interestingly, as an aside, this is part of one of de Morgan's laws, as they're called. They're really important laws. They come up loads in logic and you'll see them quite a lot if you go on to study logic further. And sentences like these, which are always true under the semantics, are known as valid sentences or tautologies. They mean the same thing. So the question is, how do we know that this sentence is true? Well, one way would be to do what we did a couple of videos ago and draw out effectively a truth table. So on the left hand side here, we have all possible truth values of the symbols P and Q, which we've used in this sentence. And here we simply use the laws which we looked at in the semantics video and we find that every one of these possibilities is one. The sentence is valid. It is a tautology. And this method is uh, known as model theory. In more complex logics, model theory is a lot more complicated where you use the semantics to reason about sentences in the syntax. In propositional logic, this is used to great effect, actually, in things known as SAT solvers or using techniques such as BDD diagrams, if you're interested in looking these up further. But there's some fundamental problems with using model theory. And the most prominent one is that actually it's often impossible. For propositional logic, we can do it. We can check every combination of true and false for all the symbols that we use in the proposition we're trying to check. But in many logics, we simply cannot do this. The next logic up from propositional logic, which many people learn about, is known as predicate logic or first order logic. Now, first order logic allows us to reason about infinite sets. For example, the natural numbers. If we want to show that some property holds about each natural number, we cannot possibly test every single number. We would need an infinite amount of time and we simply don't have it. So we need a more nuanced approach. A second idea is that actually when we were 
thinking about defining symbols, we were abstracting away from the real world. We thought we don't want to deal with all the complexities and difficulties of natural language, and so we simply represent these things using letters. But now we're testing every possible interpretation of those letters, we're kind of rolling back on our abstraction. And finally, this method doesn't really capture the intuition behind a lot of the rules uh, that we have looked at in the semantics. It's a bit of a brute force approach. And so what we do is define a thing called a deductive system. And the deductive system constrains the set of sentences in the syntax that we are allowed to write down. And it constrains them such that we are only allowed to write down the true sentences, the, the valid sentences. How do we do this is the big question. And we're going to look at the particular example in propositional logic. And to do that, first of all, we need to introduce one new concept, the concept of the rule. And this is an example of a rule. We have some things at the top, a horizontal line, and some things at the bottom. And this is a very common notation. You'll see this in lots of um, different logics. So what's this rule saying? Well, if we to read this rule in natural language, we're saying if we can show that A holds, and remember A and B stand for arbitrary propositional sentences. They're not symbols like P, Q and R. A might be the thing we saw before, one of de Morgan's laws, or it might be a far more complex sentence in the propositional syntax. So if we can show that A holds, and we can show that B holds, then we can show that the sentence A and B, connected with the and symbol, we can show that that also holds. And this is super intuitive. If we can show that the sky is blue, and we can also show that the sky is, uh, the grass is green, then we can show that the sentence, the sky is blue and the grass is green, holds. And as a general, general point, we have a rule comprising a number of premises at the top. And if we can show that each one of those premises holds, then we can show that the conclusion holds. We can show that the conclusion is true. This begs the question, how do we show that the premises hold? Well, what we do effectively is layer rules on top of each other. So, for example, if we were to try to show that the sentence A and B and C holds, this isn't actually a sentence in propositional logic because we've used A, B and C rather than P, Q and R. A, B and C might represent arbitrary formulas. But if we wanted to go about showing that something like this holds, well, the first thing we do is say, OK, the top level operator is this AND symbol. And we have a rule that can deal with AND symbols. So to show that this holds, all we need to do is show that A and B holds, and separately show that C holds. Then we can do this again. We look at A and B. We notice that the top level operator is an AND. And we can say, well, to show A and B holds, we need to show A holds. And separately, we need to show that B holds. And we work our way upwards until we reach a stopping point, which we'll get onto in a minute. Likewise for C. If C comprises some arbitrary sentence, we will be able to lay rules on top of each other and reason about why C is true. So on its own, this rule isn't entirely useful. We need some other rules that go along with it. And the next rule, which it's interesting to introduce, is a rule to do with implication. And this looks a lot more complex than what we saw up here. Don't panic, we'll break it down step by step. So on the bottom, we see something quite familiar. We see A implies B. And this is what we're trying to show holds. On the top, we see a B. And if we can show that B holds, then we can show that A implies B holds. But there's a caveat 
to this. And this is the stuff that appears on the left hand side. So in each of these cases we have a proposition separated by a little turnstile symbol. And on the left of this turnstile symbol we have some extra symbols. Now if you remember back to the semantics of the implication symbol, A implies B. If A is zero, if A turns out to be false under the semantics, then we don't really care about what B is. A implies B is always true in that circumstance. The only time when we need to think about what B might be is if A is true. So what we're saying here is, in order to show that A implies B evaluates to 1 is true, we first assume that A holds. And under that assumption, if we can show that B holds, then we can show that A implies B holds and is true. And so that begs the question, well, what's this extra symbol at the very left hand side. This is the Greek letter, the uppercase gamma symbol. And this represents all the assumptions we made in any proof tree below the current one. So perhaps somewhere down here we might have had another implication symbol which assumed something completely different and that needs to be carried up the proof tree. And the really important thing to note here is that we assume A here and we'll assume A above this line. We'll assume A in the upwards directed proof tree. But A disappears once we show that A implies B. This is known as discharging the assumption. We discharge the assumption that A holds in the rest of this proof tree. And this concept overall of having some assumptions and then something we're trying to prove, these assumptions, we call the environment. And we need to change slightly our original rule to incorporate this environment. It's not too complicated because this rule doesn't change the environment. It doesn't assume anything extra. All it does is carry any assumptions that we used further down in the tree through. So under some assumptions, if we can show that A and B holds, under the same assumptions, if we can show A holds, and the same assumptions, if we can show B holds, then we can show that A and B holds. And this is starting to look rather abstract at the minute, so let's have a look at an example. We see down here a propositional sentence, and this is actually a propositional sentence now. We've used P's and Q's rather than A's and B's. This is something which we are actually trying to prove all the way. We've got a little turnstile symbol known as entailment and nothing on the left of it. What does this mean? It simply means that gamma, which we saw over here and here and up in this rule, gamma is empty. We're not making any assumptions about what is true when we're trying to prove this sentence. What does this sentence say? Well, we're saying if P and Q holds, then Q and P holds. This is super intuitive. All we're doing is flipping the order. If the sky is blue and the grass is green, then the grass is green and the sky is blue. And yes, that's super intuitive to us as humans, but the point of this exercise is to demonstrate the use of a deductive system to prove something. So how do we go about proving this? Well, first of all, we take a look at this sentence and we think, well, the top level operator here is an implication symbol, remembering back to our order of precedence that we saw in the last video. And the only rule that we can apply so far is the implication rule. So let's do it. Draw a line and write what we need to here. So we've taken our left hand side of the implication and moved it over to the things we are assuming to be true. And under those assumptions, we need to show that the right hand side of the implication holds. And so we do this again. We need to show that Q and P holds. How do we do that? Well, we can use our rule to do with AND. The top level operator here is AND, 
and the rule fits. And in order to show this, we need to show that assuming P and Q holds, then Q holds. And we also need to show that assuming P and Q holds, then P holds. And it's at this point where we become a little bit stuck. Because at the minute we have no way of showing that Q holds or that P holds under these assumptions. We need another rule in order to do this. And we call this rule the assumption rule or ASM. This is another super common notation you'll see. We're naming our rule by putting its name in brackets next to the rule itself. What's this rule saying? Well, it's saying quite simply that if we have something A, propositional sentence A in our assumptions, then we can show that A is true. And note that there are no premises to this rule. There's nothing on top of the rule. We simply have a line. And this kind of rule is known as an axiom. And in our proof tree, once we have all axioms at the top level, and we've got nothing further to prove, we have no more premises that we need to show are true, then we know that we have completed our proof. A couple of other rules that we need in order to complete this proof is another rule to do with and. So what we're saying here, quite simply, is if we can show that A and B hold, then we can show that A holds. If we can show the sky is blue and we can show that the grass is green, then we can show that the sky is blue. And similarly, if we can show that A and B holds, then we can show that B holds. We're simply taking the other part of our AND. Now, how have we named these rules? We, we've named these rules AND E1 and AND E2. The AND symbol simply dictates to us that, well, these rules are to do with the AND symbol. And the E stands for elimination because from the top part of the rule, the premises, to the bottom part, we are eliminating an AND symbol. And the 1 and 2 are purely for disambiguation between the two rules. And likewise, for our first rule that we looked at, we name this AND I. And the I now stands for introduction, because we are introducing an AND symbol as we take the downward step. So now we're equipped with all the rules that we need in order to complete this particular proof. We've got some AND rules, which we've now grouped together. We've got an implication rule, and we've got an assumption rule. And as we go further along through this video, we'll see some more grouping a little bit like this AND. So to complete this proof, we'll first look at the left-hand branch of this proof tree. And what we've done here is simply use the assumption rule, this one, to bring P and Q out of our assumptions and into the things that we've shown are true. Should note now that P and Q under some interpretation might not actually be true. We are only assuming that P and Q are true from our implication rule. Why can we do this? Well, if P and Q aren't true, it doesn't actually matter. Because if P and Q isn't true, if this part of the implication is not true, then the whole implication is true by default. This whole concept of vacuous truth that we saw earlier. So under the assumption that P and Q is true, P and Q is true, we use the AND E2 rule to say that, well, we can show that P and Q is true, so we must be able to show that Q is true. We use the AND introduction rule to show that if we can show Q is true and we can show P is true, then we can show that Q and P is true. And finally, we use our implication rule, which we name implies I for implies introduction. We're introducing an implication symbol. We use that to take the final step. And you may have noticed, actually, that this second branch I've left out, and we really ought to prove this. We really ought to do exactly the same process here. But seeing as it is almost identically the same process, I'm not going to show that. 
So let's take a look at some of the other rules that we need in propositional logic. And I'll go through these relatively fast because the point isn't to show you propositional logic, it's to give you a feel of the importance of a deductive system in logics in general. So we have an elimination rule for or. If we can show that A or B is true, then sure they might both be true, but it might be the case that only one is true. So if we assume that A is true, and under that assumption we can show C, some arbitrary proposition C, and under the assumption that B is true, we can also show the same proposition C, then we can show that C holds. And we have an introduction rule. If we can show that A holds, then we can show that A or B holds for some arbitrary proposition B that we get to make up. And the symmetric case, if we can show that B holds, then we can show that A or B holds. So or introduction number one and or introduction number two. There's some striking similarity between the and and the or rules. Each has three rules associated with them and has an introduction or has an elimination and has two eliminations and or has two introductions. And this similarity is a concept known as duality and it crops up quite often in various logics in various different guises and it's certainly something to be aware of. Unsurprisingly, given that we have an introduction rule for implication, you can possibly see where this is going, we want an elimination rule for implication. So if we can show that A and B, A implies B, is true, and we can also show that A is true, then we can show that B is true. This is effectively saying, well, in the if-then reading of this sentence, if A is true, then we have if true, then something, and we can simply show B. That gives us our implication rules. The next couple of rules aren't quite as intuitive. They're all to do with the not symbol. And don't worry at all if you don't quite understand what these are saying or their import. I'm going to explain them briefly, but do not worry if it goes over your head slightly. We have an elimination rule. So what we're saying is that if we can show A, and we can also show not A, then we can show F. Hang on a minute. I thought the deductive system was supposed to constrain the sentences that we could write in the syntax to those only which evaluate to one under the semantics. Only those sentences which are true. But this rule seems to be doing exactly the opposite. Its conclusion is F, which we know perfectly well evaluates to zero under the semantics. So what's going on here? Well, take this example. When we tried to prove this, we started out with no assumptions. And if we start out with no assumptions, then it turns out that this rule should not apply. We should not be able to find F as our bottom level of our proof tree. The only way we can generate this rule is in certain, some certain context if the environment gamma is not empty. And one particularly useful way of doing this is in the context of the not introduction rule. So if we assume that A holds, then, and we can also show that F under that assumption, then we can show that not A holds. Some kind of intuition behind this is if we were to say the sky is green, we're assuming A, we're assuming that the sky is green. And we look out of a window and we see, oh, OK, the sky is not green. Something's gone wrong here. We've shown false. We've shown zero. From that, we can say, well, given that we assumed the sky is green and something went wrong, we're pretty certain that actually the sky is not green. The sky A is not green. These two rules give us some way of reasoning about not, 
But it turns out we need a third rule as well. And this is called the double negation rule, or DN for short. And we're saying if we can show not not A, then we can show A. And this is a really intuitive rule, probably one of the most intuitive here, but it's a rule which has caused some discussion within logic. And in fact, there are some logics which do not include this rule at all. If you're interested, go and look up intuitionistic logic. That's a logic which does not include the double negation rule. And finally, we want a rule, for completeness's sake, to be able to write down the sentence t. And this is an axiom, it has no premises, because t is always true. It evaluates to one under our semantics. So we have some rules to do with and, some rules to do with or, implies, not, and some miscellaneous rules. One thing that's worth noting is how we've represented our environment gamma. So in the system I've showed you, we have the environment listed on the left-hand side of our turnstile symbol. Another really common way of representing environments that you will see is to have the assumptions in the environment listed above. And these dots, these ellipses, represent some line of reasoning from the assumptions to the conclusion. The assumptions A to the conclusion B, which shows A implies B. Now this method makes the reasoning from the assumptions to the conclusion a bit more clear. However, what isn't obvious is the discharge of assumptions. So you have to keep track in your head that from here to here, A is assumed to be true, but anywhere further down in the proof tree, it is not. Whereas in this rule, A is explicitly listed in the assumptions in the environment in the upwards proof tree, but disappears in the downwards proof tree. So we've had a look in this video at the deductive system. And it's worth noting that the deductive system has a couple of other names. We sometimes call it the proof theory, or sometimes just the theory for short. And just as in the semantics and in the syntax, where we saw there were some almost design decisions to be made about how we model the real world and how we represent it, how we write it down, the same kind of thing can be seen in the deductive system as well. So the deductive system I showed you today is called natural deduction. It's fairly natural to think about, it's intuitive and easy to understand. There are, however, other deductive systems for propositional logic and for other logics. For example, that the sequent calculus is a deductive system which is designed to be good for automation in a computer. Hilbert style proof systems look at the trade-off between the number of inference rules, those rules which have some premises, and axioms, those rules which don't have premises. And Hilbert style proof systems try to reduce the number of inference rule, rules in favour of having more axioms. So in this video we saw our third and final element of the of logics, the deductive system. And it's the deductive system which constrains the set of sentences we can write using the syntax to those which are only valid, those which are only true. And in the next video, we're going to look at two really important properties that we want our logic to have. And these are called soundness and completeness.